In the ongoing quest to rebuild ourselves through history, we just recently began to cross over the threshold into the Iron Age. Iron is a challenging metal to master its formation and forging into useful tools. But there is another material with an older origin than iron that's proven to be the long arcane challenge for me for nearly the entire journey of this channel so far, glass. Two years ago, after several trips outsourcing raw ingredients and lots and lots of experimentation, I finally figured out the secrets for making clear glass from scratch. This was mostly a challenge of finding the right techniques and modern tools to use, combined with sourcing the most effective chemical ingredients but it was still dependent on an electric kiln, modern insulation, and other tools of today. But now, with my reset and the change of the scope of the channel, the challenge begins anew, needing to figure out and replicate how this difficult material was first discovered and mastered. So let's start this journey all over again. Everything we use comes from 8,000 generations of collective innovation and discovery. But could an average person figure it all out themselves and work their way from the Stone Age to today? That's the question we're exploring. Each week, I try to take the next step forward in human history. My name is Andy, and this is How to Make Everything. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next step in this journey. But first, while on the topic of glass, a word from today's sponsor of Warby Parker, featuring one of the amazing innovations that came with the discovery of glass. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores, offering eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, and contact lenses. Glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses, sunglasses, progressives, and blue light lenses are also available. Choosing your frames is super easy with our quiz. Just answer a few questions. You can start choosing a set of frames that best fits you. So I had to try out a few different glasses online, even use their app to try them on on my face, and then got five different pairs sent to me. I'm gonna try them on, show them to all my friends, and see what was the best look for me. Ships free and includes a prepaid return shipping label. Their styles range from extra narrow to extra wide, so they can fit pretty much any face shape. Try five pairs of glasses for free at home at warbyparker.com slash HTME. With early evidence dating its discovery and nearly 5,000 years ago, glass has a long history. My earlier challenges with the material have been mostly about producing optically clear glass, but that was a much later development. Early forms of glass started out much more opaque and cloudy. This type of material is gonna be our first milestone. The origins of glass are likely in relation to its accidental discovery, either from ceramics or metalworking. Some early forms of glazes are very similar to glass making and effectively produce a layer of glass on the outside of ceramics, which could have easily evolved into being used alone to make glass. Glass is often also a byproduct of metal production, where impurities in the ore, like sand, can often be turned into a glassy slag. There are, in general, two main components to glass, silica sand and a flux. The flux reduces the melting temperature of the glass it makes the sand easier to melt and work with. Sand is relatively easy to procure, but the flux can be a bit difficult. For an historical flux, we paid a visit to the Gulf of Mexico while in the area and looked for a plant that often served this role. Off the coast of the Gulf of Mexico in Texas, and uh, we're on some of the salt marshes here, and we're looking for a plant called a glass wart or salt wart. It's a plant that grows near salt water, and uh, you can burn it, and the ashes will produce sodium carbonate, which we use as a flux for making glass. Kind of the way it was originally done before more modern processes were discovered. So see here, it's low tide right now. Water is receded, so most likely along this edge here where its roots are getting saturated at high tide. Nice stick. I make a nice allatl. Some laundry detergent. This might be it. It looks at least very similar. There's a lot of varieties of salt wort that can be used. Should we be worried about snakes? Probably. So the sign said, it's gators and venomous snakes. So probably don't do what we're doing. See any gators over there? All right, so I'm relatively sure we have some of the salt wart right here. The plant looks very similar to it, possibly the same. I'm not sure, it has flatter leaves. It has a berry, so it's blowing to eat this and see if it kills us. It might be something else, but it also would be growing in the same environment, so it'd probably work. So this guy right here, I'm pretty sure is glass wart, or at least the, ow. Prickly, the local variety of glass wart, which is also known as, I believe, red wart, or red glass wart, because it turns red. Burning these should be usable for making the soda ash or glass.
All right, so this is the glass wart that Andy collected in Texas. We're looking for soda ash. We've already burned it, but after burning it, we soak it in water, strain it, and then boil it, and what's left is the soda ash. Ooh, witchcraft. <laughs> Once the water is boiled off, a relatively pure sample of soda ash should remain, which can be used in the glass as the flux. Another very useful flux that ended up being a major key for making clear glass in my previous journey is borax, a natural compound we were able to collect in California. Borax has an even lower melting point, which makes the production of glass even easier. While historically borax was available, its use in glass came a lot later. So for my first attempt, I'm going to be using this later knowledge to my advantage and then attempt to make a more historically accurate version of glass after I first succeed with borax. In my previous experiments, I found a roughly 1 to 1 to 1 ratio of these three ingredients tended to produce the best results. With my glass ingredients are ready to melt, the next challenge is getting the right temperature, ideally around 2000 to 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. Having just constructed a cob bloomery in our first iron smelting attempt, which happens to operate at roughly the same temperature range, I attempted to repurpose the bloomery and see if we could turn it into a kiln, hopefully able to melt our glass. Alright, so after doing the iron smelt, we were able to salvage the bloomery and we kind of rebuilt it as more of a kiln. So we have a little chamber here with a shelf that opens right up to the coals. We have a crucible here. We have our sand and soda ash mix. I'm gonna just put that in there and put it in proximity because we don't want the actual ash to get inside, otherwise it'll probably discolor our glass and make it mostly black. We don't need to go it quite as hot as steel, but pretty close. I think 2100 degrees Fahrenheit is probably ideal to get everything melted. Glass making in ancient times is usually a two-step process. First to make the glass and then to actually turn the glass into something. So we're just going to do the first step right now and that's to make an actual glass. Let's start hitting it with the bellows. Alright, we've been running for a while. Check on inside. It is... I think it's fused with... We have partially formed glass. Crucible is pretty much half gone, disintegrated. So that's not great. <laughs> so one more big crucible. Try it again, put it on the top. Maybe if we heat it slow enough, it won't get uh, directly heated by the coal. I just want the coal to directly on it. It's too hot. So if we slowly heat our way up from the top, maybe we'll get something that is not a complete failure. In a worst case scenario, maybe we'll get some glass we can pick out at the bottom. Take the bottom of the previous one and just kind of shove that in. It's kind of a lid to stop too much ash from getting in there. Light it up and give it another shot. Hopefully it doesn't flip over. Okay. Maybe. partially formed glass and uh, seems like mostly succeeded at making more of a, a glaze which was the uh, precursor to glass so almost <laughs> the shiny turd <laughs> glass but mixed with a lot of impurities it's a uh, close but not quite there the failure of the first attempt seemed to primarily be because of the very direct and uneven heating that was hitting the crucibles causing them to crack and break on the exposed side, while not reaching the high temperature on the other side. So for the next design, I want to try getting the crucible directly over the heat with some amount of separation, hopefully producing a much better result. Similar to this depiction I found of a cupola style kiln, with the crucible sitting on a grate directly above the heat source. I'm not sure why they put fish in there. Unfortunately, the bloomery was unsalvageable after the second firing, so I needed to start over again, and decided to invent a new building material that'll be a little bit more reusable bricks. So using a ceramic brick mold, Lauren formed 120 bricks out of clay. Yeah. 
on fire pottery called grog is applied to the outside of the bricks to help prevent any cracking. Then left them to dry for five days. I made all these bricks, but they're a bit um, wonky. So I'm gonna use the knife and shape them down, kind of take the rougher edges off so that when you stack them to make the kiln, it has more of a tighter seal. Now to fire them and build the kiln. I built a small fire and then surrounded it with all the unfired bricks. And slowly built up the fire to be hotter and hotter. Until finally sealing it up and letting it burn down overnight. In the morning, while suffering a few casualties, resulted with bricks that are fired on the one side. Now to take down the pile and build the kiln, making sure to put the already fired face of the bricks on the outside. Using a mixture of sand and clay as a mortar, I slowly build the kiln up taller and taller. For the shelf grate, we actually had a circular shelf Annalise had made earlier for our bronze smelts in the draft kiln that we had ultimately decided not to use, and now could finally be put to use. I built the kiln with a lower chamber for the fire and heat source with an opening to add more fuel and feed it forced air and an upper portion to hold the crucibles. Now to build a small fire to finish firing off the inside portion of the bricks, once again sealing it off to burn down overnight. With everything now set and ready to begin the actual glass melt, I once again started a small fire in the kiln, loaded up the crucibles, and slowly built up the fire and the heat. It's inside the chamber, it's just below 500 degrees. It's a good time to start putting in our crucibles and getting them warm enough. Big one. Uh-oh. Oh. There we go. You know. All right, so I had the kiln all built, warmed up, fired it a few times, see if the brick mostly fired as much as I could. Now loaded it up with a couple of crucibles. We just have just a wood fire going right now. We have two crucibles warming up. It's about 500 degrees up here. And eventually, as it slowly gradual warms up, we'll uh, seal it up, get it a little bit hotter, and then we'll switch to charcoal and force air, and I'll get it up to our final melting temperature, around 2,000 degrees, a little bit over. Biggest challenge is gonna be the crucibles not cracking this time. The whole structure not collapsing, I guess. It's uh, got a few cracks in it. It's not perfectly sealed, unfortunately. Could use another layer of mortar or whatever, but we're gonna give it a shot and see how well it turns out. Hopefully we can get a sizable portion of glass this time inside one of the crucibles.
All right, so I completed the second kiln made out of bricks and uh, ran into a few issues with it. It's definitely gonna be a work in progress and getting the perfect kiln and hopefully now that we have bricks we can make it a little bit more reusable. Uh, as I did it I realized I had a few design flaws that I hadn't forethought. Should have had like another hole higher up where I could have fed it additional charcoal as it started to run out and uh, possibly some sort of closable doors. I think having some actual two years would have really helped. Potentially having multiple ones coming from different directions to all feed the charcoal all at once so you get maximum airflow. Ended up having the hole in the back kind of start to form, so I just kind of pushed it open to add more charcoal into it so I could fill it better and some firewood. And that seemed to definitely help in getting the temperature higher, but it also created just a huge hole where all the heat and flames escape from. So it kind of decreased the efficiency of it, unfortunately. Looks pretty cool, giant flames shooting out of it, but uh, not the most efficient. The challenge with this is definitely getting a, a hot enough heat to actually melt the glass, but not too hot or too quickly too hot, where it would crack the crucibles and lose everything. With the bloomery, the challenge was it got too hot too quick and kind of just destroyed the actual crucible and our result kind of just coated everything else to get a great result. So this one, we succeeded in maintaining the crucibles and not having them break and contain the contents. But just looking on the outside, I can tell that they didn't fully melt, but there's definitely some formation of glass starting in some of it. Reminder, this is early forms of glass. It's not gonna be transparent. It's gonna be very cloudy. It's gonna have coloration to it. It's kind of just the, the very first forms of glass. Optically clear glass came a lot later. So let's uh, dump these out, check them out, and see how they turned out. We have some glass starting to form along the edges and at the bottom here, there's a piece of glass. Some of the little guy that clearly was able to get to a little bit higher temperature and uh, obviously a lot more of it kind of melted together. It's a lot more glass-like substance at the bottom. Hard to get out, but let's see if we can get this very cloudy chunk of glass here. Still has a bit of flux in it to be kind of ideal, but this might be usable to actually start like glass working on. So I think this could be considered a success. So that is most definitely glass. Lauren, what are you doing? I'm just taking pictures for our Instagram because we have an Instagram and you should follow us on Instagram. Oh yeah, they should, you guys should check that out. Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> One of the big roadblocks for this has been that we just don't really have a permanent space to do anything, so everything we make kind of ends up getting destroyed in the end. But now with the bricks and some new developments, should have a more permanent place where I can kind of just slowly improve it without having to go back to scratch with H1. So hopefully we can get some uh, better long-term goals along the way. Having just barely reached the temperatures to make glass, I'll next need to improve my setup to produce a higher and more controlled heat, and then move on to making the tools needed for actually working and making something out of the glass. Thanks for joining this first step and what will likely be an ongoing challenge. Thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. It's their support that makes challenging projects like this possible. If you want to see this project continue forward, please consider supporting. Thanks for watching. Art. Cool. Art, more like sharp. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.